Welcome to the latest podcast from the Watercolors Aquarium Gallery, brought to you from the Aquarium Rush Studios in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay, I gotta be honest with this one. I'm having a hard time. Like, are we really gonna do this? We're really gonna do this. We're gonna do talk it, about. It. We're gonna talk about the quarantine process, and we're gonna we're gonna go into some some detail. Um, that we have spent years and dollars and people, we, we burned we, some people out. Yeah. Learning, figuring out how to properly quarantine saltwater fish on a mass scale. The reason that it's a hard one for me to like, just let's just lift the veil, open the curtain. Here, here's what we do. Are we letting out these proprietary secrets or are we sharing <laughs> with the world, or sharing our knowledge with the world? Listen, if anybody wants to put in the effort and work we take in our saltwater systems, more power to them. I hope that they do. My genuine response is something along the lines of, uh, come at me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're willing to take on the challenge and the effort, do it, I guess. Really where I landed is we do this because this is how we firmly believe that it should be done. And it's a lot more work. And it costs a lot more money. But in the end, it's how it should be done. And, and I hope everybody else does it this way. Uh, and I want to specify just for, because we know what you're talking about here at the table. But when he says this is the right way to do it, this is referring to the fact that the industry as a whole tends to shunt responsibility of bad fish keeping onto the people buying them. Like, oh, you were the one dumb enough to buy a sick fish, not someone was... Irresponsible. Irresponsible. Enough. Thank you. That's the word. Irresponsible yeah. enough to sell you a sick fish. Right. Yeah. Well, and and oftentimes I think like it's that not everybody is willing to admit or return a fish if it dies. So they're banking on the fact that if you sell as many fish as possible, maybe twenty percent of them are coming back to you dead, and that's like a loss that that. It, the industry as a whole is willing to accept. Right. And that doesn't make any sense to me. We are not willing to accept those kinds of losses. No. Those are the types of losses. Like, we've talked about this in other podcasts yeah. where you and me in the basement will be like, what are we doing wrong? This is the conversation we're having downstairs. Yes. Yeah. We've had conversations where I thought, this is, this is not an exaggeration, where I thought about, I should go get into a, totally different industry because yeah. we weren't doing it right and we were killing fish. I remember you looking me dead in the eye and saying, so what do you think the store process would be like if we got rid of the saltwater department? <laughs> <laughs> well, we did yeah. get to that point of if we can't do it, why should we expect hobbyists to be able to? Yeah, absolutely. Like, and if we can't expect ourselves or hobbyists to be able to keep fish and keep them healthy, then the saltwater hobby shouldn't exist. Now, thankfully, we've pushed past that and we've found ways that work. And um, we track, we keep data on our quarantine process. And I'd say over the last three or four months, we've been at 90 or more success rate, maybe one or two that's 80 in a smaller mm -hmm. shipment. Um, and I would be interested to hear if any other fish stores have success rates similar to that over a four, four week period, even counting fish that go into tanks and then come back. Cause I would consider that the same time frame. Oh, I completely agree. And I don't think it's 90%. Okay. So here's <laughs> a, here's the, the, the short, a brief, don't worry. We're going to go into details. We're going to, we're going to reveal secrets, but here's the short version in case you're a little confused about exactly what we're talking about. When we get in a batch of saltwater fish, that entire shipment goes into a roughly 320 gallon system and we keep it there for four weeks and we medicate and we uh, use all kinds of processes to make sure that those fish come out of that four week process as healthy as we could possibly get them to be. So that when they go home with someone, they don't die. That's it. Yeah. Bottom line, don't die. Yeah. And that's, that's, what we, that's what happens. We, 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 are, we have reached that point that Amy and I were talking about it this morning, that we, are, we were trying to remember 
in the last nine months, how many saltwater fish? So we do put a guarantee on our fish. Yeah. How many times have we had to replace a, a saltwater fish in the last nine months? We couldn't remember one. Yeah, I I couldn't. I can't think about it. I'm. We we must have gotten some sort of bring back for some sort of random accident, but I honestly cannot remember it if we have. Every fish that we've had come back came back alive, and the answer was. He's just not getting along with my other fish. Yeah, yeah. It's like, we had that. And it's like, oh, okay, well, yeah. <laughs> that, that'll happen. <laughs> we have a yellow chorus wrasse and a leopard wrasse down in the hospital tanks right now that did go out to a customer's place, and somebody beat the crap out of them. No idea who. We <laughs> seemed, they're still alive. We had them for four days after they got the crap beat out of them. And uh, I think they're going to make it, whether they're in their, you know, the, the tail on that chorus wrasse might never be the same again. But he gets around all right. Right. Okay, so here's a shout out to um, if we do have any retail <coughs> store owners or retail store employees in the business. We are doing this successfully. We are doing this, and as a store, we are making money. Mm-hmm. The excuse is out there that, well, it's just not practical for a store to put all, yes, all of their saltwater fish through a full four-week quarantine process is simply that. It's an excuse. Yeah. I think Amy has framed it to me multiple times as you're either spending money on fish warranties or you're spending money on quarantine. Right. Yeah, and I'd just rather not have the dead fish in the first place. Yeah, yeah, and that's not, that's not, yeah. a, that's not, a, that's not a thing, right? Yeah. So the big the big online places. Here's, here's my biggest argument with buying fish online. And I have a bunch of them. And I know it's because I'm a local business owner. So of course <laughs> I'm jaded in that topic. You're, right? you're a little bit prejudiced. I am. <laughs> and, I, and I recognize that and I fully and openly admit that. But here's the big challenge. Even there's one of them out there that has a fantastic reputation among hobbyists. Y'all know who I'm talking about. But they rely on their 14-day guarantee as your safety net for buying from them. Yeah. We rely on hardcore, we are going to do everything we can to make sure that fish is healthy before it goes home, and we're going to develop that personal relationship with you. <laughs> and that fish. Yeah. And that fish. <laughs> yeah. it, it sounds like bragging, but honestly, we've, we've worked really hard to get to this, the point where we wouldn't be recording this podcast if we did not feel like, like completely confident in this process. Yeah. So yeah. we just are. Like, we, I just have that level of confidence with what we're doing and why we're doing it. So right. I'm not trying to brag about it, but it works and we have data to back that up. It works with so many different kinds of fish that it's not supposed to work this way with. Mm-hmm. Um, fairy wrasses, flasher wrasses, flame angels are all fish mm-hmm. that are... Uh, we had a mandarin dragonette that mandarin dragonette. just came out of quarantine, right? Or is it about a week or two? Um, he came out. He's in the cubes because I'm not ready to sell him because he's not eating heartily enough, but he's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All of those fish are supposed to be exceptionally sensitive to copper. A lot of the books even say, don't quarantine those fish with copper. I, I'm going to be completely honest. Yeah. So I was not a part of the saltwater developmental, like research and development of this method. So when I was first dropped into it a few months ago, and then you guys were like, all right, so you're going to do this and this and this with this fish in the back of my head, I was like, okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then they came out just fine. I'm like, okay, I stand corrected. Yeah, I think so many of the issues with copper come from improper use of copper. It definitely is dangerous to fish if used improperly. I think it's um, inaccurate testing Yeah. and improper use. Yeah. Yeah. Da- there, are, there is very much a such thing as dangerous copper levels. Mm-hmm. But we put fairy resses, flash resses, and flame angels all of them through copper. Yeah. By routine. Every time. And they're good. Mm-hmm. Our success rate on fairy and flash harasses. So flame angels have been very successful for us. We just haven't been able to get them for like four months. <laughs> right? but yeah, the, availability is a completely <laughs> different issue. The fairy and flash harasses that we're putting through this process, they work. Yeah. They're solid. They're ick-free. 
They're disease free. They work. And they're eating. Yeah, they're yes. eating. <laughs> <laughs> well, then maybe this is probably a good time to break down the process, maybe not the mechanism of our quarantine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Charles, actually, you've been doing that most of the time. Do you want to go through <laughs> your routine? All right, so I'm, I'm going to interject here with step one. Okay. The wholesaler that we buy from mm. knows our process. A&M Aquatics in Lansing, if we're, if we're opening up, we're opening up, right? Yeah. We're, we're usually a little, a little like, hush-hush about yeah. what vendors we everyone use. Everyone knows we get our... Everyone knows everyone, fish uh, Guess what? Every store in Michigan gets their fish from A&M. They do, <laughs> right. Those guys are amazing. I consider them friends. They do an amazing job with their fish. And that's step one of our success is starting with a wholesaler that cares about their fish. Absolutely. I have visited other wholesalers. I visited one that I used to buy from until I visited them and then I stopped buying from them. There are other fantastic wholesalers out there. Um, right now, we use a as our primary saltwater wholesaler. Okay. Right, step two, Charles. So you said step one, good wholesaler. Yep. Um, this is a follow-up question. May and may not end up in the podcast. <laughs> uh, you s- mentioned that he's aware of our process. Are they intentionally trying to match their salinity to where we put ours? Uh, we have talked together, and they have made some changes, and we have made some changes based on what their salinity is. Okay. But they have made changes as well based on ours. Because I will say... Almost invariably, every shipment that comes in, I don't have to do, like I do a baseline 20-minute drip acclimation because it feels weird not to do it, (laughs) but I could probably get away not doing that because they're really stinking close. Well, I think think we (laughs) matched our base salinity on theirs. They came up a little, we came down a little. Mm, So one of the industry standards, and this is something that I used to do in the past, is um, to just maintain your fish-only systems at hyposalinity at a moderately successful hyposalinity. So true hyposalinity gets us down to 1.011 specific gravity. Uh, as a retailer, I used to keep my, my tanks at 1.015 to 17, and the wholesalers were keeping them in that range as well. All right. Charles, summarize the process. The so four weeks. The four weeks. So the process Lay is... Lay it all on the line. Here we go. Um, <laughs> so when they first come in, I, of course, drip acclimate them in. I leave them for 24 hours. The next day, I start... Wait, you drip acclimate for 20 minutes, and yes. then you keep them at that, whatever they came in at, in the system, 24 hours. We yes. don't drip acclimate for 24 hours, Charles. Right. You learned that lesson. Um. Yeah, no, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, so we get them in, we leave them in for 24 hours. Then the next day I start the process of lowering the salinity down to a true hypo salinity, down to 1.011. How long do you take to get there? How many days? Three days. Three days. Yep. So that's one of the key learning points that was a painful learning experience was we want to get them that low don't do it in 20 minutes. Don't do it in an hour. Don't do it overnight. Three days. Three days. Um, do you want me to walk me walk through how I do that? Yep. Okay. Uh, so he mentioned we have a known volume for our systems. That means that I'm doing a 40-gallon water change every one of those days with hyper saline water. And that's depending on... Each day, I have a general idea, but it's somewhere between 1.028 and 1.02. Wait, but we're getting them down. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I got my numbers mixed up. Okay. Hypo. Hypo. So I'm adding, actually pulling out 40 gallons of water and adding in 40 gallons of RO water, but make sure you buffer. <laughs> that I seem to recall a story of that was another learning experience. That was another learning experience, right? Yeah, if you continually add neutral water to a saltwater system, it affects the pH. Yeah. <laughs> and fish don't like that. It's pH and the alkalinity. Yeah. And all of those things have had a significant effect on fish health and whether or not they're going to survive the quarantine process. Yes. So then we get them down over three days, putting in RO. 
then they're down to 1.011. Right. And the main thing that we're treating for at 1.011 is flukes. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, it turns out that there are saltwater bacteria that can eat Prezipro. And if you have long standing systems, they will stick around and boom and bust when you are dosing it. <laughs> that was one of our, one of my pull my hair out moments was we're treating with Prazipro, we're treating with copper, and we're still getting flukes. How is that possible? And this was one of the, I, I mentioned there was a, 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 a quarantine person who got just totally burned out on the process. Yeah. And he got burned out because we threw him into the fire and said, do this and do that, and do this and do that. And he, he just, and some no. of the stuff that's happening, there were losses. And I said, this is the learning process. There's no instruction manual out there. There's all kinds of instructions on how to quarantine a fish. In a 10-gallon tank. In a 10-gallon tank. <laughs> tank, right? How about a shipment of fish? How about 30? Yeah. How about 30 fish in a 300-gallon system that's a standing, continually running quarantine system? Right. Yeah, because completely draining it and scrubbing it between shipments is just not going to happen. Yeah. It can't. Like nope. Otherwise, we'd lose that system. Right. So the, the Prozipro thing. Um, Proziquantinol is still a... a medication we use. We use it on a regular basis in single-use systems. Um, that particular quarantine person came to me and said, okay, so we were going downstairs and we were seeing flukes still on the, in the systems after we were treating according to the manufacturer's recommendation with the Prozipro, and somehow the tanks were getting cloudy and it looked like a bacterial bloom, which immediately made me turn to ammonia, and ammonia was zero, nitrite was zero, and nitrate was low but present. I mean, it was a perfect water test with cloudy water, which that does not make sense. No. That's not how it's supposed to happen. He found this, uh, actually, he found a scientific paper, mm -hmm. which if you watch our YouTube channel, you've seen Charles's video on how to read a scientific paper. So he found a scientific paper on bacteria that eat praziquantinol. <laughs> like, just... <sighs> Throw it away and go home for the weekend. Like, <laughs> yeah, unplug all the systems. <laughs> oh. Switch to fresh water. We now sell guppies. Uh, no, now we're selling like books or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe my baseball card collections were something new <laughs> from 1978. That is definitely what it felt like at that time because how do you counteract that? Flukes don't respond to medications other than Prozipro. Right. There's no other medication that we have found that will treat them. Right. And let me just say that this was a time period where when I look back on it, I'm really glad I only worked here part time <laughs> because I can remember coming in the two days I worked that week and being like, did it, did, whoa, why is everyone so depressed? <laughs> yeah. 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 And at that point, we had flukes are so contagious. We had flukes in, in three or four of our service tanks. We had flukes in our entire coral system. Yeah. We had flukes in every single one of our quarantine systems, and we had no idea how to get rid of them. Every we, time we treated with Prazi, we saw this cloud. We stopped selling saltwater fish at that time we because did. instead of quarantining to insure healthy fish, we were insuring sick fish. We were guaranteeing that your fish was infected with flukes. Yeah, and that's not why we're here. Right. So we had saltwater fish going through quarantine, and we had a couple in our systems, and we just weren't selling any. Yep. Copper does not kill flukes, by the way, in case you're curious. No. Copper does not kill flukes. No. Copper will kill the fish long before it kills long flukes. It kills yeah. I'm sure at some point it would kill it, but... <laughs> at, like, extreme at, toxicity. At the <laughs> point where it's no yeah. longer useful anymore. Right. <laughs> All right. All right. So we've so lowered down. We're, we're now at... Oh, well, wait. We didn't, we didn't explain that the conclusion to that is medications do not kill flukes... Copper does not kill flukes. Hyposalinity does. Hyposalinity does. So that's why we've now lowered down to 1.011. And then the next step of that is you keep it there for 10 days. 10 days. Do you do any water changes while it's there? Is that... I don't mess do? with those tanks while they're in okay. hyposaline. Cool. That only works if you have a high water volume to fish number ratio, which yep. we maintain. Yep. 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 Lots of observing, lots of... Yes. And oh, by the way, leopard dresses, copper band butterflies, mm -hmm. mandarin dragonettes, all of them. Yeah. Everything gets problem. treated that, that same way. Right. Without a problem. And then once those 10 days are up, I spend three more days bringing the salinity back up. And this is where I was 
mixing my crossing my wires. Right. This is where I'm using hyper saline water, somewhere between 1.027 and 1.029. And it, you kind of get a feel for what's happening in the system, what you need to do. But that range is pretty safe to work with. And again, three days. Three days. Three days. Not a drip acclimation once. Three days. Three days. Yep. And we read some st studies out there about what, how, how much of a change a fish can take in how much of a period of time. And we pushed that as far as we dared push it and found that when we did it in two days, we lost fish. When we did it overnight, we lost half the fish, mm -hmm. not quite half the fish. We, the, the numbers were terrible. We were, we were getting close to a 70% success rate and starting to think that that was the best we were going to get and thinking, are we going to be okay? Are we going to be like personally comfortable with a 70% success rate at like just bringing them back up? That's, that's killing a lot of yeah. fish. <laughs> Personally, I'm not okay with a less than 100% success right. rate. <laughs> every, single one of the, every single one of those losses, we sit down and have a meeting and discuss, okay, what did we do wrong? And oh, by the way, the answer is always, what did we do wrong? Not what was wrong with that fish. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes we can't figure it out. And, it and might, those are the ones that haunt me. Yeah. yeah. And it might be there was something wrong with that fish. But that is the, yeah. after we've explored every option. Sometimes we do have to have the talk of, okay, as many things wrong that can go with a human can go wrong with a fish. It can have a stroke. It can have a heart attack. It can have a, you know, sometimes yep. we do need to take that reset it and can know get that. stuck to a power head. Yeah. Yep. It can it, decide it's just going to stop eating. Yep. It, it can could jump have, out of a tank. Its kidneys could fail. Like, what? Right. It's, t it's a tiny animal. There are a lot of things that can go wrong. Yeah. And that conversation comes after like five or six other conversations <laughs> about what did we do? So we do have to take a step back sometimes I remember, to remember having that. that. That conversation. So one of my jokes with my wife, she is a, she, she's the director of recruiting for a trucking company. And you may remember this line from a, a movie in 1982. <laughs> what was that name of that truck driving school we saw on TV? <laughs> so that's a little 1982 uh, movie reference that, that we joke about as our, I don't want to do this anymore because we killed too many fish again. We had one of those moments when we realized the lids weren't perfectly on the tanks. <sighs> Coming downstairs and seeing this fish that's got a week left to go in quarantine lying on the floor dried up. Yeah. Bad. <laughs> Yeah, and that was just like constantly chasing every single tiny hole. Every single tiny hole. And that's what we've been doing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, let me, I'll, I'll go into that in a minute. Let's yeah. keep going, Charles. Uh, then they spend another 10 days mm -hmm. at that salinity. But this entire time they've been being treated with copper. But the goal is for at least, quote unquote, two weeks. But if we're going to spend time observing them, we're also kind of like, let's just push it a little bit farther yeah. with the copper treatment. <laughs> so are you using copper during hyposalinity? Yes. Yes. Copper is there the entire the time. The whole time. The entire time we're actually maintaining those systems theoretically have a constant level of copper in them. And what is that constant level? The goal is somewhere between 0 0.20 to 0 0.25 parts per million. The ideal being 0.22. I like it. We yeah. spent a lot of time coming up with the right test kits. And we tried all of them. And uh, tr I, 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 they just didn't cut it. There was not a test kit out there. The optics on those test kits, are, they're just, it was just too relative. You know, we'd look at it in one light and we'd think it was a 0.5. We'd look at another light, we'd think it was a 0.2. And that's treatment level or stress level. Yeah. Like those, yeah. That's the difference. 0.3 or above seems to kill them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's where you're going to see, that's where the flame angels and the fairy and flasher right. asses start dropping off, right. is and above that level. Some of the really popular test kits out there, we couldn't tell the difference. And so I think that's where the idea that, that flasher rasses and flame angels cannot survive copper is because they can't survive fluctuations in copper and they can't survive copper being too high. Yeah. 
copper at just that level of 0.2 to 0.25, they're fine. The other factor that we figured out is we were using copper sulfate. And we had been using it, and we've been testing it, and we're like, these tests are inconsistent. They, mm-hmm. They're meaningless. We have the NICE test. We have, this should work. We should be able to not get two separate readings out of the same water. Um, and I actually messaged a rep at CCAM. Mm-hmm. I actually sent them, because I know that they research their products, and I know that they know why their products work and how. So I was like... I have no idea why I cannot get a copper reading. I'm not using your copper. I'm sorry to say, but please right. just whatever you can do to give me advice. And she's like, well, are you using chelated copper? Or are you using copper, copper sulfate? Like, uh, I <laughs> guess we're not using chelated copper. Well, yeah. those tests don't work unless it's chelated copper. Right. So quick product switch. And now our copper was working again. <laughs> like our just tests fine. could work just fine. <laughs> boom, 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 <laughs> boom, boom. And yet now we use cupramine, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. We use Seachem cupramine yeah. as our copper. And it works fantastically. It works yeah. Another fun part of the process is I, I'm so thankful. I came in after this process was figured out. We have it down to a, every time we do, we have it down to the point where there's a known quantity of copper we need to add back in based on how much water we took out of a system. Right. <laughs> those that are Christina's calculations. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know what we would have done without her figuring out those little calculations and her meticulous tracking of what she's added and what she's I, like, she took the tangled mess of all those threads that we had, right. that we knew what worked, we knew what didn't. And she just put them together into a process that just works. Right. That's amazing. Ugh. <laughs> it, that was that was that was priceless. Yeah, that's what we needed. That was going through a mess and yeah. coming out on the other end with a process and yeah. a process that worked. And that you know that's that's how we did it. How did we solve quarantine? One fish at a time. Yeah. Every time we lost a fish, every one of them. And we still do that now. Yeah. Why did we lose that fish? Okay. Yeah. And why did we lose forty five percent of that? Shipment. Yeah, there, right. there were times, and to, to roll back, this was a time where we had significantly cut the amount of fish we were ordering, right. and we had significantly cut the types of fish that we would order. If we knew that we had a, and we track the success rates with different species of fish, too, if we knew we had less than, I think, 60% or something like yeah. that, we would not order that fish anymore. So oh. even among that, we were still getting losses with the fish that we were fairly confident in, and getting fewer of so it's not like we were still ordering in 50 fish a week and losing 30 of them it was we were specifically trying to experiment and find what worked that was a crazy part of the process right like okay we're struggling with this we're struggling with this we need to eliminate as many variables as possible so let's go through and say what are the fish we have the high, and I realize you just said this. I'm just yeah. you know saying that saying it in a little yeah. bit different way. What are the fish we have the highest percentage of success with, we need to have a hundred percent success rate with a shipment so that that four week process, we don't lose a single fish. What 10 fish can we do that with? Yeah. And that's what we did. And, and that's, it was, that's why that's, we only had those 10 fish in saltwater yeah. for a long time. That was it. Yeah. I think it was a coral beauty. Yeah. The yellow tang. Mm-hmm. There were a couple of tangs couple in there. A couple of tangs. Yeah. Um, plenty of clowns. There were a few, a couple of wrasses that we did really well with. Yeah. Um, but, and even we had to adjust it as we were going. I know when we were in the phase of the, the flukes phase, we were doing fine with fox face until we decided to switch to hyposalinity and then we couldn't keep fox face. And that was when we realized, oh, they're really sensitive to big salinity, salinity swings. Right. They can't go down that fast. And that's what prompted us to lower, like to spread out the rip the speed of how we were lowering this hypo salinity. That's, that's the, that kind of summarizes, illustrates why we had to do it that way. Because as a store, we can't say, okay, we're going to get in a shipment of fish and this batch, we're going to do this way. And this batch, we're going to do this way. And this batch, we're going to do this way. If we could do that, we could put all the flame angels in a little box and yeah, <laughs> And quarantine them <laughs> one way, and we could put the fox face in another batch and quarantine them another way. Like the yeah, we would need beauties and fifty and ten gallon tanks that were all separate and get fifty percent water changes every day, and that that's when it becomes practical. impractical. 
practical. It's just not practical. No. So we had to come up with a process that was everything. The only fish I can think of that we don't put through that is seahorses. Yeah, and occasionally like some scaleless fish. Sharks. Yeah. We don't um, put sharks through that. Don't really put frog fish or... Right. We, we have done eels. They, they've they done fine. fine. They were fine. Yeah. I wonder if we could do that with a frogfish. Probably. It just happened to be that we were able to isolate it, and it was yeah. pretty low likelihood right. of coming in with disease. So right. you can't keep a frogfish with other fish anyway, so yeah. getting it in. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's like it's already quarantining. Yeah. I wish you guys could have seen the size of the silver side I fed it today. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Probably longer than his body. It's good. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Lumpy. I think that kind of... That's at least that's, the process. That's the process. Yeah. Because then we, at the point where they're at standard salinity and they've gone through copper, it should be mathematically impossible for them to have any parasite. And right. I think that's not an overgeneralization. We have not found a parasite. So what we do is we, we, we've got five 300-gallon systems in the basement. And that's five systems we can put a shipment in. And each shipment stays in each one of those systems for four weeks with one extra system in case we decide to get a different, different wholesaler or something like that. Or we get really that's, excited about something. Really excited, <laughs> or, or we run into an issue and we've got to keep the, the shipment in there longer. Oh, and let's also acknowledge the fact that in addition to those, we have, I think, four hospital tanks for hospital that tanks we to isolate to isolate specific like injuries or whatever right or uh someone traded in this fish we're going to hold it here until i can pop it in in the next shipment right from there the fish are transferred into our what we call our fish retail system and that's roughly a 1200 gallon centrally filtrated system it does have a uv sterilizer in it Currently, there is no medication in that system. <gasps> what? <laughs> 1,200 gallons and 150 fish in it? Yeah. Com probably more. With no medication in it <laughs> yeah. at all. And we have not had disease show up. We are still very paranoid about it. Every uh. time we add a blue tang or a powder brown tang, we are like... Up, like, this is the one. Look this at its fins. It's going to be the one. If, it, if anybody's got it, he's going to show up right. first. And we watch. And, and so far, so good. That, that system is an isolated system. There are no inverts in that system in case we need to treat it with copper. Yeah. Which and we had to about a year ago. Yeah. And we've had certain circumstances where, like, we'll, we'll sell a fish to a service tank. A couple months later, that tank has ick or something like that. And, well, let's just run a round of copper just to be safe. Right. Um, but usually that's somebody got sneaky and bought something somewhere else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have never asked a customer that question. <laughs> I've, I've Are you to. cheating on me? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it feels so jealous like that, but it's like, it's seriously a medical question we need to ask. Did you get your fish somewhere else? Because I know what our fish have been through and they should be solid. It's, it puts us in a really tough p position because we have to tell somebody that we will only guarantee our fish only if you never buy a fish somewhere else. And the reason that we can say that with that much certainty is because we know no other place can be as certain as we are about how healthy our fish are. Yeah. And I, I want to reemphasize Amy's statement that when I ask you, did you buy a fish somewhere else, I need you to give me an honest answer. So we can help. Because yeah. if you give me the wrong answer, like if you tell me, that means that I might have to reevaluate the entire process we're doing because that means from my perspective, something slipped through. I need that honesty. I mean, do you remember the panic we had a couple of weeks ago when one of our customers sent us a picture of a trigger that had a piece of sand on its fins? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we go and we like, we're looking at our retail system. We're looking at all our quarantine systems. I don't see anything. It can't be ick. I don't know why it could be ick. If it's ick, let us know. We'll figure something out. But how could it be? And he's, he texts us the next day, like, it's not there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> or, and, and I know this is, this was fresh water, mm -hmm. but let's just talk yeah, about this how morning. This morning I had a phone <laughs> call where I was initially confused about the wording and I thought someone told me that they had bought fish from us and they had ick and I genuine response on the phone 
was a panicked, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he had to go, oh, no, no, no. I, I didn't get it from you. I just want to know what your process is. And I was like, oh, thank God. Yeah. Because I was quickly doing the math in my head of how did I miss it? What did it go wrong? Where it, is it in my tanks now? Am I selling fish to people today that have it? Yeah. Like, we we take that so seriously, and sometimes it startles people a little bit. So that's that's how seriously we take it. Every every single fish, and every single fish that we've gotten through quarantine, and every single fish we've lost, better teach us something. Yeah. Better keep us striving to do it better. This is the process that we use right now. In three, four, five years, will it be the same? I have no idea. It's changed so much in the last five years. Yeah. Where it's going to end up, I don't know. I genuinely hope it's not the same. Yeah, we've got to keep learning, right? Yeah. Yeah, keep improving. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've been doing a lot of interviewing lately because we've been looking for a couple of people for the shop. Mm -hmm. And one of your questions is, why is it okay to keep animals in captivity? And I don't feel bad about saying that here because if yeah. anyone applies whatever if they know this and they got this far into our podcast maybe that's not something <laughs> right um but we always have to justify we like do. we have to we and do. and i think that it is because it's so important for us to have animals that we can look at and care about and have an association with to inspire people to conserve the environments that they yeah. come from among other things but that's not really my point here my point is that if we're going to do it, we have to be able to say that we're doing it well enough to pay respect to the animal that we're bringing in. We are, we are doing the best we can. Yeah. And, like, and to drive home Amy's point, my uh, giving a quick preview to mm. a talk I'll be given, <laughs> my understanding of conservation of peat swamp forests in Southeast Asia is only at the point it is because I keep licorice grammys. Yeah. Yeah. And you are one of the more impassioned people I know talking about that kind of conservation because there's something that you love that lives there. Yeah. Everybody listening to this probably has a fish tank. And if it's a saltwater tank or a freshwater tank, but particularly if it's a saltwater tank, look up at that tank right now. And here's a, a hard truth that we need to all drive home. Every single fish you have in your aquarium right now, if it was taken from the wild, had one purpose, and that was to reproduce. It's not going to because it's in your aquarium. That is a huge responsibility. Now, there might have been some other reasons that it wasn't going to. Yeah. Like it may not have ever grown up to reproduce. Well, and if you're just looking at the odds and percentages, it probably wasn't probably going to probably wasn't going to is, is <laughs> believe it or not statistically and ecologically speaking that is a that is a factual yeah. statement but for all you know you might have just removed like the ras equivalent of genghis khan out of the population <laughs> you right. know and you have to acknowledge that yeah. yeah yeah some of those fish it's like your attitude you're like nah i know you would have done well <laughs> <laughs> we have to take that responsibility and all right, here's, here's another give. We're giving away all our secrets, right? If you're interviewing with us, here's the perfect answer to why it's okay to keep animals in captivity. We understand what we experience. We love only what we can experience, and we protect what we love. Yeah. I seem to, that's a Jacques Cousteau quote, isn't it? I believe it is Jacques Cousteau. Because I think, yeah. I seem to remember saying something. I at least tried to quote that. Yeah. <laughs> I messed that quote up so many times. And that's, that is, I, I am not taking credit for that quote. I am, but that is my philosophy. That is the culture we have here. That is the philosophy of what we do. And that is why we do this. I do, I have had the opportunity to experience it firsthand. I have been scuba diving in salt water. I do this so that I can experience it. I experience it because I love it. Because I love it, I want to protect it. Yeah. That's why it's okay. It's yeah. education. Education, that's bottom line, yeah. right? Well, the responsibility shouldn't intimidate you. That should excite you. I mean, the, just the opportunity that you get to that animal, you know? Right. Right. But that's why we have to have 100% success rate has to be always the goal. And anytime it's not, we failed. Yeah. 
Oh, my fish died. I don't know why. <laughs> Fail. There was no reason, but it just died. Fail. Yeah, that's there's always the, a reason, by the way. That's right. why the when we can't come up with an answer, I mentioned this earlier, that's why those ones haunt me because oh, always. if I can fit, hone down what it is, that gives me an opportunity to fix it next time. But if I can't figure out what it was, I can't learn. Right. So here's, here's a, we're going we're gonna to summarize some of the really big talking points here, some of the big things that we learned through failure that now we feel like we've done right. right? For example, chileated copper versus non-chileated copper. And there's a whole lot of arguments out there for why copper sulfate is the best. It's much less expensive. Yeah. There's all kinds of reasons out there for, for using Just harder to copper test. sulfate. It's harder to test. And testing to get proper levels of copper has, for us, our experience has taught us it is one of the keys to success and one of the reasons for failure. Not enough copper, the it gets through the. It just needs I to be think precise. Of a single other fish disease right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not enough copper, the it gets through the. Par any sort of ectoparasite. Ectoparasites get through. Yeah. Too much copper. And what, what too much copper does is a, a number of things. And one of the things is it, it, it suppresses the digestive system. Uh, it messes with the, the nervous system. Too much copper kills them. Not enough copper parasites get through. It's got to be the right amount of copper. And chileated copper is easier to test. And for us, it has killed the parasites. Yeah. Um, other factor on copper where it is a little bit risky is it does tend to promote head and lateral line erosion. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why you don't want to just run copper. That's why we don't run copper in our big fish system where fish spend most of their time. Right. They only get it for those four weeks and then we pull them out of it. Right. You can sometimes see a little bit of deterioration, but it's nothing compared to having parasites. It seems to every single time heal very quickly oh, as yeah. soon as we get them out of it. Yeah. Right. Uh, long term use definitely would cause some serious health effects. Right. Right. And, and one thing that I feel like people need to frame this in their minds when we are doing quarantine, we are functionally that fish is like family physician. Right. But we have a patient that cannot consent to any procedures we're doing to it. And we need to be very aware of that fact. <laughs> yeah. And we need to think about that. At least I do. I need to think about it from the fish's perspective. Because it has, I know I've said this before, it has its own versions of hopes and dreams, and that means something. It does. Yeah. And yeah. it's not that if a disease gets in that we're getting bad fish. It's that in the wild, parasites are common. Parasites are everywhere. Yeah. Uh, wild fish don't have to go through shipping three or four times that's going to stress them out and weaken their immune systems and make right. them as prone to being completely taken over by disease. Right. So it's just parasites are present in their systems well, from the in wild. A, in a closed system, the concentration of those yeah. parasites is, is overwhelming. Yeah. So it's not, well, these are bad fish. They have disease. It's, these are wild fish and they come with organisms that are also found in the wild. Also throwing out there, wild fish are totally worth it in the cases that we opt to do them. Like, yes, they do come with these extra steps, but I think this this is the point where I'm like, uh, check out our wild caught versus captive bred yeah. podcast. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't need to get into it right. here. Right. right. There right. are lots of good reasons for doing wild caught fish. It is still there's still value in that. Um, moving on from copper, Prozipro. If you are doing home quarantine, I highly recommend Prozipro as yeah. a method to quarantine fish if you're doing home quarantine or if you, if you see issues. It is a fantastic medication. It did not work for us as a long-term solution. Yeah. As in, we have a continuously standing system. Yeah. Your quarantine systems at home probably don't function that way. Yeah. That bacteria <laughs> takes a while to build up. Yeah. And if you're gonna, it's there, it's hard to get rid of, but it takes a while to build up. If you're going to quarantine at home, you're probably setting up a 10 or 20 gallon tank once every few months. You're not leaving it up that whole right. time. Or if you did, that bacteria would die off because you're not just continually dosing Prozipro. It's, it's a pretty low risk factor at home. Yeah. 
Well, and in a system like that, where you st- you're starting with zero copper, and you're starting with a, a, a normal salinity level, you can simply add the the recommended dose of copper yeah. without really having to precisely test for it. Yeah. If you're continuing to use that copper system and do water changes on it, mm-hmm. you have to be able to test for it. You need yeah. a relatively accurate test, but you don't need to be digitally accurate like we do with yeah. our copper testing. And, and that's one thing that I think should be a take a home message here because the way we quarantine doesn't scale up or down. It scales to exactly the level we do it at. That's <laughs> right. why it was a learning process. The because fish store level. Because yeah. Yeah. there's yeah. a well-established hobbyist level. There's a well-established public aquarium level. And we are not at any of those levels. No, no. no but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be held to the same types of standards. Right. The well-established hobbyist levels, there's the tank transfer method. That's a great method. Yeah. Doing simply prosy and copper. If you're using that, there's a really good chance if you do that for four weeks, you're going to get everything. Yeah. A fish or two at a time. Yeah. Right? And that works. It did not work for us. It does not work on this kind of scale. No. It does not work for a system that every four weeks gets a new batch of fish. So uh, if people get fish from us, do we recommend they quarantine? I will never tell someone you shouldn't quarantine. (laughs) I I think everyone should. But I'm saying you are far safer than you would be buying somewhere else. I'm going to say it's, you know, we're laying cards on the table. It's probably not necessary. We have done, and let's say it even, let's say it even this way. We have never, uh, not saying it that way. Let me say it this way. (laughs) I am confident with the methods that we use. If you only buy fish from us or... You only buy fish and then put them through a proper quarantine system. You are doing it right and you are doing it safe. Yeah. And your chances of dis- introducing a disease are extremely limited. Yeah. No. And, and, and one thing to keep in mind is that, like, I think framing how I frame things, I need to contextualize that for the people who don't Mm. get a lot of the behind the scenes. I'm a fairly anxious, cautious individual with a scientific background that assumes that a non-zero chance of anything is possible. That doesn't mean I think anything, most things are probable, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, it's not impossible. I would usually say like, it's always better if you also quarantine, but you probably don't need to. Yep. Like, <laughs> see, that's a fair statement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and here's maybe here's the way to say it, right? We are a service company. We take care of many of the saltwater fish that go through our quarantine process. We don't worry about them going into our service tanks, and those right. ser- our service customers don't buy fish anywhere else. They get they get everything from us. Yeah. Their I- tanks are healthy. Their tanks don't have disease in them. Yeah, and for that, us, the stakes are so high for getting right. disease through our process right. because it could mean an entire crash of a tank and loss of the contract. Yeah. So, well, like, oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, and that's a level of accountability that, that I think a lot of people underestimate because it's not just like, oh, it's in your hands. Good luck. It's like, yeah. no, we're coming in and we're the ones that have right. to be responsible for it, even after we've sold it to you. If your fish gets ick and you are a service customer, we have to fix it and we will. And we have done it where we have gone to a customer when we didn't have the quarantine process worked out perfectly. We have taken all of their fish out of their system, held them for six weeks so that the parasite would be out of their system, and then put them all back. By the way, we'll only do that for a service customer that only ever bought all of their fish from us. And I'm confident in saying we probably won't ever need to do that again. Yeah. But we did. Yeah. And... On on the hobbyist level, the stakes are just as high. Mm -hmm. You know, that tank that you've put your hopes and dreams and all of your heart and all of your money into, one sick fish can crash that entire system. Is the risk worth it? No. Like, (laughs) no. And how many tragedies have you heard? We want to promote this hobby. We want people to do it. We think it's fun and worthwhile. But that first tank crash... Get so many people out of it the can hobby. Be a hobby killer. Yeah, just 
everything died so i don't want to do this anymore how do you like invest thousands and then get the will up to do it again yeah and on the flip side as long as we're putting cards on the table i legitimately judge people that come in and they're like oh i'll just get a new one and i'm like that's a fish that could have lived like and i don't say could have as in like I might live to be 120. I mean, its life expectancy is like 20 plus years right. and it died at three. You messed up. <laughs> you messed up. And it is your fault. Yeah. The fish that die in our store, they are our fault. Yes. We killed those fish. Anybody that says differently is not taking the proper responsibility for what they do. Yeah. An aquarium gives us a unique opportunity to keep a group of pets together right. in a way that not a lot of other pet keeping can. And that's the way I would like people to see them as. Yeah. Not as, yeah. well, we've just got, oh, let's throw a bunch in there. They're colorful. It's that each one is a pet. Oh, now we're stuck with this thing until it dies. Yeah. Well, what? let's just kill it. Didn't you want it? What? <laughs> it's an animal. <laughs> yeah. Like, would you say that about a hamster? Or some a puppy? Pe- some people do. Yeah. But like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, I only say hamster because we have this sort of like innate emotional attachment to mammals. Yeah. And I think that they're actually far less intelligent and far less endearing than most of the fish we keep in aquariums. <laughs> I <don't> disagree. <laughs> We're a little biased on that one. Yeah, we are a little. I, I mean, I love my fish and yeah. I, I do think hamsters are pretty cute, but like, there's just this sort of sense that that's a pet and fish are decorations. Right. And another unique thing about aquariums is, and I'm totally plugging my t- style of fish keeping, biotope aquariums are a unique ability to create a little slice of a habitat in the wild and put it in your living room. Yeah. Like, yeah. like you can kind of come close with some terrariums, but not, you're not quite there. We figured out how to keep a part of the ocean alive. Yeah. yeah that's crazy. And in a your tall living room. order, for right. the record. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a frequent, me and Ben, have a frequent joke that we're like, who was the idiot that decided, let's put salt water and electricity together in a box and we're going to keep things alive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a kind of a stupid idea, honestly. Right. <laughs> but totally worth it. Let's keep making it work. Yeah, I hope that people listen to this and they don't see this as condemnation. They don't see this as, like, intimidation. Because really, like, when we say, when we want to talk about serious, dense subjects like this, it's because we want to demystify it. Yeah. I think there's this, like, this idea that there's all these complex ideas that cannot be understood. And it can be. And we've done the work to get to understand it and now it's just well now you know yeah. now you know that how parasites are killed now you know how they survive in fish and you can use that information to make your hobby easier there's these damning statistics out there about i believe it's the statistic is something like 70 percent of fish taken out of the ocean die before they reach a home aquarium i believe it I don't believe that's true with us. I genuinely think that's not what happens with how we do things. Well, we have the data to prove it's not. We do. <laughs> well, we don't have the data to prove what happens no, before it gets to that's us. That's true. But I believe that the wholesalers we buy from, we buy from AM Aquatics. Mm-hmm. We buy from Sustainable Aquatics because they do tank raised. We buy from Biota because they do tank raised. And we buy from Ore because they do tank raised. Yeah. Right now, that's it. Yeah. And it might limit our selection a little bit, but they're going to have good fish. Your and fish are going to live. If you take care of your aquarium and you buy fish from us, they're going to live. Yeah. Yeah. The that shouldn't be revolutionary. Here, I know it shouldn't, right? <laughs> that should be the. But like the call to action really is to the retailers here tonight, though. That's this is how it should be. This is what this is what we should strive for as an industry, not just this little. This little 2,500 square foot store in downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan. But the, this is the, this is it the should ind- be the model. Should be. That's what you should expect from the people who are selling you fish. It's why we don't have puppy. Why puppy mills are being destroyed dwindling, and yeah. shut down and dwindling. Yeah. Because like they said, shouldn't exist. <laughs> right. They like shouldn't I, exist. Like I said, come at me, bro. Like, yeah. <laughs> like. But 
also, to, I guess to anyone who could listen to this, you know, ask us, talk to us about it yeah. because this is to us so important. And this is the way to improve the fish keeping hobby. It's not for hobbyists to get better. And I think that that trend has already started. Mm -hmm. I think that hobbyists are already pushing each other to be better, but they need to push up the chain. They need to push at the stores and the stores need to push at the wholesalers and the wholesalers need to push at the distributors. And that's the way that we get good fish. We will continue to do that. If there's any wholesalers listening today and you want our business, prove it. Yeah. Anim Aquatics did. Yeah, they did. They have not <laughs> disappointed us. They are not perfect and nobody is. No. We look at their lists and they don't have smooth hound sharks on their list ever. Right. They don't order them. No one should. And if we see something that we have a question about, we ask it. I will call the owner of Anim Aquatics and say, hey, what do you got cleaning rests on your list this week for? And he did once in the last two years. And he said to me, and I believe him because of the relationship that we have, we ordered a box of fish and they substituted. And I'm 100% believe that I because do. I do. the wholesale model is very different than the retail model. Um, right. Oh, so I don't want to get into the specifics of that, but if, when you know right. how that works, you're like, that would totally happen. It's a lot tougher. It's yeah. a lot tougher. Um, when I asked another wholesaler, why they had cleaner asses. He said, oh, dude, they sell so well. <sighs> Who cares? I don't care. No. Sorry. I don't care about selling fish much well enough to sell a fish that shouldn't be sold. Right. <laughs> I remember someone saying, are you willing to pass up on a sale because of whatever? And he basically tried to find a condescending way because of morality. Yeah. And I was kind of like, yeah, money's not my incentive here. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I said that to my aunt. Yeah. I care about more. I care more about the life of this fish than I do about your money. We get along much better now after I said that. By the way, <laughs> that should speak for itself. Like it if, should. If someone who wants your money is telling you that they're not going to take it, that should mean something. And if maybe this is the moment for us to kind of give a specific example to kind of put our money where our mouth is. So earlier, Amy mentioned, made a jab at me where she said. We don't acclimate fish, drip acclimate fish for 24 hours. <laughs> that is a very specific call out. Yeah. Because I'm just picking at the wound there. <laughs> <laughs> and I will explain it here. I might have explained it in a past podcast, but it's relevant to here. Um, I forgot about fish I was drip acclimating. It was an Achilles tang. The, Your Achilles heel, if you will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the next day, the conversation wasn't about... This was an expensive fish that we had lost. It, the conversation was, oh, this was a fish who had a great personality. He was beautiful. It was a unique fish. And that's lost to the world now. Yeah. And we had worked so hard to get him healthy. Yep. Yeah. And he had rewarded us with that personality. And I single-handedly ruined it. <laughs> yeah. That's tough. We learned from it. Yeah. That's what we have to keep doing. And we've all had those. Right. So some of the really good takeaways that we learned. Changing salinities on fish. The levels you need to to get them to hypo, both up and down, need to happen gradually. Yeah. You cannot take a fish from 1.017 or 1.023 or 2.5 and drip acclimate it down to an effective treatment for flukes. Uh, even freshwater baths, I think, are way more stressed than they're worth. Way more stressful. We tried those for a while, and, and, and we saw some effectiveness. We were, we were getting rid of some flukes with, with freshwater baths. But, but the losses, it was too stressful. And to see the fish, it's clearly a really uncomfortable process, right. just by observation. So slowly bringing that fish down a point or two per day. So we're going from 1.017 to 1.0. One zero, that's six, seven points in three days. So a point to a point and a half a day. Max. Max. Both directions. Yes. Back up and back down. Yep. Once you're getting into the two range, you actually can push that a little bit. I, I, bringing a fish from 1.024 to 1.027, that's, that's easier. 
even 1.0 to 1 to 2.4, that's easier. When you're getting down to the ranges where it's actually going to be effective in treating for flukes and other diseases, those are those are levels that are not natural for a saltwater fish to be in. And that's it's gotta happen slow. Yeah. Well, once you're getting outside of like the two zero to like two six range, what you're doing is right. you're outside quote unquote optimal physiological conditions for the fish. And that means any sudden movement outside of that optimal range has to be slow. Right. Oh. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine dropping something off a cliff and slowing it down before it hits the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so hyposalinity, non-ciliated versus ciliated copper. Prozipro, love the medication, doesn't work in our situation. Specifically. Right. Works <laughs> in lots of other situations. We always have it on and we use it regularly. We still use it often in fresh water. Yeah. Um, oh, fish jumping out. <laughs> Fish jumping out was just a stupid makes one. me cry. And it was after we had solved all those other other problems. Right. It was like, oh, this is what we're losing fish right. for now, really. We got in a small shipment, and a blue throat trigger, and a blue spot jawfish jumped out. Of a like, I think there were five inch maybe yep. And I right. think there were five fish in that order. Right. Yeah. We did a very small order that time. Yeah. So all of a sudden, that's a. I can't do math, like a 55% success yeah. rate. Hello. <sighs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's why it's another reason why our like numbers were artificially low before is because when we have small shipments, yeah. one loss is a big deal. And it, it still is when we have big shipments, but right. it doesn't show up as much in the numbers. A digital test kit versus a titration kit or an optical test kit that you got to look at and try and figure out what it says. The, op the digital test kits are still optical, but it's a digital read instead of trying to trust our own eye. Our own eye is not reliable enough on this kind of scale. Yeah. What are some other takeaways? UV sterilization, we don't use it in quarantine. No. No. I think it, I think it masks. I think it, uh, it's, about this, it's about reducing the spread of disease. And that's all it does, which is good in lots of situations. But it doesn't guarantee that you've re eliminated the disease or the parasite. And yeah. this is my uh, reporter, uh, like, uh, can you follow up that question? Yeah. You earlier mentioned we have a UV sterilizer on our fish-only system. Yes. Can you answer that question? Sure. So we have it on that system because that's our big system after they've gone through quarantine. That's a, if we miss something, that can help catch it. But that's only if we missed something. Yep. Yep. Also, it helps with algae, algae spread. Well, that's true, too. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the other big ones? All right, so our system, breakdown. It's four 75-gallon tanks on a wet, dry filter. That's it. Well... Heaters. Yeah. Heaters. There's right. not even a protein heaters skimmer on that system. Heaters and circulation. No, no protein skimmers. We do, we do so many water changes, it's gosh darn ridiculous. Yeah. We um, have an entire RO reservoir system just for doing water changes right. on those systems. It's a 100-gallon system that refills almost every single day. Yes. Right. What are we missing? Like if somebody said, okay, I know how to do this now. No, wait, you don't because we didn't mention... We talked about buffering, very important. Oh, buffering the RO water when you're bringing stuff down or when you're bringing it up, keeping pH stable. Yes. Also, uh, I know we've harped on this, but test your copper, test your copper, test your test copper. Your yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think this can serve as a how-to guide, but it can serve as a place to start. Yeah, I think you're right. I know this one was hard for you, but for me as a person who thinks information should be freely exchanged, exchanged I, I really appreciated you going out on a limb for this one. That's the scientist in me versus the entrepreneur in me. You know, we, we figured it out. Now we know how to you do it what? and no one else does. If somebody wants to steal this secret, have at it. Good luck. Here's what you need. Yeah. About 1,200 square feet of free space and you'd need five... 300 gallon plus systems that are divided. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, someone dedicated enough to work on it every single 
day. And that's the hardest part. Right. Because <laughs> right. I couldn't do it. Do you want to break down how many hours a week I spend on it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know if we want to know. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter at that point. Okay. What matters... To, again, to all of those retailers out there that are listening to this podcast going, oh, yeah, that's ridiculous. There's no way I could do that. I don't know how to say that right. We pull it off. We manage. We're making money. We're it, making money. We are a successful retail store. We have the healthiest fish. We have the best team. It, it's worth it. It works. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot of work. We keep fish alive. That's what we do. That's and what every, the goal of a hobbyist is, is to keep them alive. <laughs> like <laughs> Every single retailer out there started as a hobbyist. They started with their main goal is to keep fish alive. Yeah. And we but should never lose sight of that. Let's all do that. <laughs> yeah. Let's all keep it fun and keep those hands wet.